Hello, I'm Justin Cates, Director of Emergency Management for the City of Nashua, New Hampshire, and I'll talk a little bit about today about our efforts to virtualize our emergency operations center during COVID-19 and what we see as the future for emergency operations centers within our organization as well as within the emergency management profession. Uh, to give you a sort of a disclaimer to start us off, uh, the solutions that we'll talk about today are um, the solutions that worked for us in Nashua, uh, but they may not be the best solutions. And that's the reason why if you look at this INSPIRE session, there's a number of other uh, fireside chats and presentations that have been provided by other practitioners of emergency management. Uh, and many of them have provided some insight that I think uh, is far beyond what we've done in Nashua. And uh, it's worth taking and considering everybody's approaches as you move forward with your virtual operations. The other piece is uh, the platforms that we're using in Nashua were really based off of our availability, uh, what we had available to us uh, within our office and uh, the ability for us to quickly deploy them uh, based on existing licenses and availability there. Uh, but uh, it's something as you move forward with your organization, consider uh, what types of cloud-based services you're already using. And um, it's, it's very likely that the, the majority of the functionality we'll talk about today could be replicated on other platforms, including ones that you may already have uh, working within your organization. This picture uh, is uh, sort of the worst vacation ever. The, um, as, as COVID was ramping up, uh, this was probably March, early March, uh, as things were getting out of control. And uh, this was the last vacation I've been able to take. And uh, right around this time, we were considering about what types of actions we would have to do in order to get our emergency operations center up and running. So um, I just always, use that as my, my start to, to kind of tell you where we came from on this whole process. So our overall planning started in February, um, you know, coordinating and briefing with our, our city divisions and departments. And um, what we found was that there was a pretty quick escalation week uh, around March 9th. And that was probably around when you saw that picture of me in Florida. And that week, we really needed to come up with a, a decision as to whether we were going to um, whether we're going to operate our physical emergency operations center or whether we're going to move to a, a, a virtual platform. And really at that point, I, I, we really didn't know what types of an impact we would see on our operations and um, how easy it would be for uh, the coronavirus to be transmitted between people. And you know, so it, there, there was a lot of kind of confusion as to whether we really were going to have any sort of concerns within our physical EOC space. We had uh, previously experimented with some uh, virtual EOC tools uh, years ago uh, using um, Google Sites and, and kind of created uh, some very basic functionality when it came to being able to uh, store files and uh, collaborate with people during some sort of an incident. And um, all the stuff that we had put together was still available. It was, it was still uh, still set up and, and really was something we could use to kind of start off our virtual EOC process if we decided to use it for, for COVID. Uh, so what we decided was uh, we were going to work over a weekend to take that existing um, pilot that we had built and, and get it built so that it would meet the basic functionality that we needed to open up a an emergency operations center. And the benefit would be is we could uh, sort of roll it out uh, slow to see what types of changes we would need to make. And the platform that we were using, Google Sites, was pretty easy to make changes on the fly. So uh, we thought that this would be a good approach to, to see if a virtual EOC uh, would be possible for us. Uh, one of the things we also did was we set up our warm EOC site, uh, which is over at the police department. Uh, we did that over the weekend as well. And that way, if this virtual EOC setup turned out to be a dud, we would at least be able to shift pretty quickly over to our physical site. Uh, I think the biggest kind of lesson learned from, the, um, from this initial rollout and the decision-making that, that went into deciding on virtual versus physical was, I think we were much more proactive than our city uh, counterparts, as well as many other jurisdictions around the country, 
when it came to recognizing that COVID-19 was going to be a, a pretty significant uh, event for us and, and a very long event. But I didn't really recognize, I was sort of ignorant to the, uh, to the impact it was going to have on our EOC operations. I, I always, I guess, felt that we were just going to be able to open up an EOC for anything, you know, other than maybe comms failure or some sort of a, a facility impact, but uh, never really thinking about how a pandemic would impact our, our, our EOC operations. So definitely a big lesson learned for us. So uh, to set the stage, and I think this is important because this talks about how we really organized our, our virtual EOC platform. Uh, we had set up a, a sort of a unique uh, organizational structure that uh, we had never really used before. Our, our EOC um, was, was based off of the incident command system and, and always has been. Um, and, and what we did is we took that model, but rather than uh, creating the, um, the normal functional uh, groups within operations, you know, having a public works group and a um, fire group and all the you know, people that you would find within operations. Instead, we decided to focus on what we were calling a problem oriented task force approach. And uh, the idea here was that we would create these task forces, we'd put somebody or maybe two people in charge of each one of them that had the responsibility for that issue. And then all the applicable partners for that specific issue would be a part of that task force. Uh, the rest of the organizational structure is very much traditional ICS. Uh, you'll see most of those units are things that you would find within the ICS training. Uh, but these problem-oriented task forces were, were sort of a, a unique approach for us and, and it actually worked out really well. Uh, but this really served as the, uh, the foundation for the way that we organized all the different components within our virtual EOC platform. And I also will just note that this um, org chart was using uh, Google drawings. And so we were able to pretty quickly um, make changes to this org chart in real time on the cloud and also embed this chart in much of our documentation without having to worry about version control or, or anything like that. So some of the considerations in, in deciding to go virtual uh, during that early March timeframe. Um, our physical emergency operations center has never really been fully functional to the extent that I want. I mean, it works, but um, when you look at other EOCs across the country who have hot sites, um, ours is really, it's an embarrassment, honestly. Um, we have, have, since I've been at the city, uh, I've always had a warm site that uh, we have laptops and uh, cabling and phones that we can pull out. Uh, not really intended for sort of a no notice incident, uh, but we can set it up and configure it for something where we have some advanced uh, notice. The problems with that site, um, especially for what we were thinking about with COVID-19, uh, was the technology was starting to get pretty antiquated. Um, laptops, all that uh, was, was, was getting pretty old. And then also the space. For the first time ever, we were going to have to really build out um, most of our positions within our, our organizational structure. Normally, most incidents, we've got a pretty small rollout and um, this was going to require a substantial number of people, really more than, than we had seats for within this, uh, this classroom space over at the uh, police department. So that was a concern for us uh, for this incident. Uh, number two, the infection prevention. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, this was really the thing that I think we were most ignorant to and didn't really have a good plan for. And um, we were really concerned about uh, the kind of the cleaning of the space, sanitation of the space, which as we learned over, over time um, was not really as much of a concern as, as was the airflow and um, physical distancing measures and, and those types of things. Um, sanitation wasn't really, it wasn't on surfaces for the most part. Uh, space, which was definitely a big concern for us, um, probably a few years ago, one of the things we were able to do is set up a more permanent site uh, there at the police department adjacent to our normal EOC. And that's the picture at the bottom, right? And uh, that's a, a space that was sort of a storage closet before we renovated it into a, a training classroom, but also uh, for, for use as a, an immediate EOC site for a no-notice event. There's only about 
um, there might be 10 positions there um, in that in that space and it's very tight and cramped and certainly not uh, conducive to physical distancing. So that was certainly a concern for us as, as well. Uh, and then really the personnel activities that we saw in the initial stages of COVID-19 as we were making the decision of whether to go virtual or not, uh, we knew that public health was going to be a, a key player within our, our emergency operations site. And um, we found that a lot of the senior staff that would have been in the EOC, uh, they, were, they were out in the, the community, they were uh, going out and testing people, they were dropping off supplies at people who were COVID positive. I mean, it was, they, were, they were very much involved in field work and getting very close uh, to people who were COVID positive. And I, um, I was concerned that, you know, if they were going back and forth to the EOC where there was the potential we were going to have some sort of a mishap. So um, with that being said, we, we decided that we were going to try and, and prevent that kind of a, a mishap from happening. The third uh, concern we had was the coordination with what we would call non-typical uh, EOC stakeholders. Um, you know, there's normally for an EOC activation, we have a representative from each of the city departments and they serve as sort of our functional leads for each of those uh, groups within operations. Uh, but this event was gonna require a substantial number of people who weren't typically involved in the EOC. Other municipal leadership, um, the mayor's office was gonna have to be pretty involved in this whole incident, including the mayor himself. Um, and uh, also the businesses and nonprofit community. We found that uh, they were a massive component of this response and, and they um, are not normally all in the EOC. Normally you have a representative from the business community, a representative from some of our, our NGOs, but um, not to the extent that we were gonna see for COVID-19. So these, these are some of the considerations we had when deciding uh, whether we were gonna go virtual or physical. And, and we made the decision to, to, to go virtual. So some of the initial concerns we had as we decided to go down that track was, um, one thing was was really in the EOC, uh, since we're not in a very familiar environment, most people aren't in a very familiar environment when they're operating in an EOC. Um, a lot of times there'll, there'll be questions or poor decisions that are made on, on specific actions. And having everybody there in the room allows people to catch those things before they become a problem. And uh, being in a virtual environment, we weren't gonna be able to do that. So definitely something that we, we were concerned about. Um, we were also concerned about uh, the challenges of um, not having everybody face-to-face -face in the room. Uh, there's a lot of, of loss when you have people communicating over the phone or via text. And uh, they call that uh, media richness. The more, um, the more realistic that conversation or that communication is, um, is, is higher in media richness uh, or presence, social presence. And uh, that was something we were concerned about uh, without being there physically in the EOC. Uh, fragmented response, uh, we were concerned that if there were people that were working there on site at uh, various locations within the city, but we were working the, the virtual emergency operations center, uh, there could be a possibility where we wouldn't be able to coordinate effectively because some of the decisions that we've made in person, while others would be made virtually on this platform. I think our one of our biggest concerns was training staff on the new technology. Um, we were concerned that there would be uh, a, a, a massive effort to get uh, some of our, our staff members who are not very tech savvy to get onto a platform like this. Um, so that was a big concern. Um, we were concerned that IT would would really not be an approval of what we were doing, especially since the system that we were looking on, on Google Workspace was not one of their platforms. Uh, we, we didn't use that. We were primarily a Microsoft shop in the city. And by Microsoft, I mean, we were using Exchange Server and uh, shared file servers and things like that. We weren't even on Office 365. So we were concerned that they were gonna kind of shut this whole thing down pretty quickly because it wasn't one of their approved uh, tools. 
credentials was was something that we didn't really have a good plan for, uh, especially since we were going to be using a number of different tools that were not all using the same uh, username and password. Um, even more so, not using the username and password that the employees from our city are are using to get into the Active Directory. So that was uh, going to be a, a struggle. And uh, the state of New Hampshire uses WebEOC for their uh, sort of virtual EOC platform. Uh, they use it for uh, situation reporting and resource requests and, and things like that. And, and what we were going to put together was not going to interface with that well uh, or at all. So um, that was going to be a potential problem. And then um, I think one of the things that we were still sort of, you know, it was still an unknown was the internet connectivity and bandwidth issue. There was a lot of talks early on about the, the shift of all these people working remote and was that gonna sort of bog down the internet, uh, especially internet connectivity for people's homes? Uh, would they be able to get on video conferencing or, 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 or any of these things? So that was something that we, we also considered very early on. What we came up with was really a, a key feature set that uh, were three big areas. So the first being uh, video conferencing. We needed to be able to replicate the in-person meetings and briefings that we do in the EOC. Uh, then we also considered what about the conversations and collaboration that takes place in those uh, functional groups. You know, so all the people that are involved in public works activities, all the, all the people that are involved in uh, medical related activities. Um, so we needed some sort of a way for them to uh, document and track and, and collaborate on whatever they were working on. And um, this we use group chat for. Um, and that was something that we figured would probably be the most appropriate. It was very similar to what we would find people doing on uh, WebEOC or something like that. So that was that was our approach for that situation. And, and the final piece was collaborative documents. And this was really critical because we needed some way to enable all of our uh, stakeholders that would have been involved in the EOC to be able to see the same documents, edit the same documents uh, without having to worry about version control or, or anything like that. So that was another area that we were concerned about. And we also came up with two sort of overarching priorities. The, the first being keep it simple, and that would help to resolve the concern about training staff or, um, you know, running into issues with um, sort of overcomplicated systems. And then the second one being um, just get the platform out. We didn't have much time. We had to get something out because as we were building this tool, um, there, were, there were key decisions that were being made, and, and really they were being made poorly because we didn't have some sort of a platform up things like canceling school and, and, and stuff like that, that we were, were having some communications issues. So we had to get something out and we would build the features as we would go. And, and we found that that was very successful. Uh, one other thing, you know, this minimum viable product, uh, for those of you that are watching, this is part of Inspire. There's also a session on project management for emergency management. And, and uh, there's some videos that talk about this concept of minimum viable project products and agile engineering and how you can use those to build really useful solutions. So our platforms that we use for this system, we used uh, Zoom, we used Slack. Uh, we also had some components that were on ArcGIS Online and then Google Workspace. And I'll talk more about each one of them and how they applied uh, to this system. But you know, one key point here is that uh, it wasn't all using one brand or all using one um, set of, of user credentials. We had so many different kind of pieces to the puzzle here. And, and that was something that presented some challenges as, as we moved forward. So I'm going to start off with this call center uh, problem that we had. This because this was one of the first things that was really brought to our attention as we were starting to build this uh, system out. Um, we had made the you know, decision that we weren't going to use uh, the physical EOC, but it had really been set up with phones and everything so that if we needed to shift over to that location, we would be able to. And public health was pretty concerned about um, some process for us to take calls from the public. Um, and this was before there was any vaccinations, before there was any testing. 
they just wanted some ability to be able to answer questions for the public, as well as to give them some insight as to what they need to do uh, if they, um, you know, were positive or, 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 or had symptoms or whatever the case might be. So they had asked, can we use the EOC um, as, our, as our location for, for these calls? And um, it, it just was not going to work out very well. Again, we ran into the same issues that we were going to have if we were using it as an EOC. There wasn't enough space. People weren't be able to be physically distanced. It just wasn't, it didn't make any sense. So what really saved us in this case was uh, the city had just made the, uh, the, the change over to a voice over IP system, Cisco voice over IP system. Uh, which enabled them to have much more flexibility in sort of virtualizing the phone system and also a, a, an app called Jabber that Cisco makes, which allow people to use their cell phones to, uh, to answer uh, calls that were on city lines. Uh, so having that functionality enabled us to actually remote all of our call center folks uh, that had to be sort of stood up during this event. We don't have a permanent 311 uh, or, or anything like that in the city. So we essentially had to, to you know, put these phones in people's hands and say, you know, here you go, you're gonna be uh, serving as a call taker during this response. One thing we also lucked out with was we had a pre-identified what we call the emergency information line, which was a simple to remember number. And we used that as our, uh, our main number for people to call. And then what it would do is it would hunt to the, the various phones within uh, that hunt group for, for call center operators. And the other uh, very valuable thing is, is because we had shifted over for this virtual EOC to using uh, collaborative documents, using Google Docs and Sheets, uh, all the call center operators were able to work remotely and be able to share information about uh, calls that they were taking or kind of triage them and provide them to the right people. So that was definitely a big, big piece of this as well. Uh, some of the lessons we learned from this call center operation, really, we got to know how the, the voice over IP system work, even though we made this transition. Um, one of the problems we ran into was uh, really just understanding how we could route calls and how we could configure the whole system. Um, making sure that we know what the call flow is. So uh, once the person calls, uh, where do we want the number to take them? Especially as we started to add uh, more complex um, automation when it came to uh, you know, dial one to, to get to this organization or dial two to get to this organization. Um, as we progressed along with the incident, there were also more reasons why people were calling and more uh, places that we needed to direct the calls. So having that mapped out is, is in another essential piece of this. Uh, there are call center guidance documents that have put out, especially from the public health realm. CDC has put out resources on how to set up a call center. Um, that was something that I think was very helpful to us as we built this out because we didn't really have a good call center plan. Um, having templates set up for, uh, for pre-recorded messages, especially for those uh, auto attendant uh, systems on your, on your voice over IP. And then um, the relationship with other call centers. Uh, there was a, a 211 up at the state that was also being uh, directed uh, to citizens as the number one place that we should be calling to schedule uh, vaccinations or testing or things like that. So knowing when to promote our phone number versus the statewide 211 was something that uh, I think we still have some challenges with. And then I think the final piece with this call center is really knowing um, how to reduce the number of calls to the call center, helping to reduce the number of call operators that you need uh, through frequently asked questions or web forms so that you can automate it uh, digitally. Uh, and there's some, some tools out there, things like openreferral.org is, is sort of a, a way for you to set up a standard schema and platform to, to provide information on services that are available, social services that are available during a crisis. We even did a project uh, during the National Day of Civic Hacking uh, with the uh, Hack for Boston, Hack New Hampshire, um, where we um, basically went through the process of creating sort of a solution for our nonprofits in the community so that people could find resources during COVID-19 and sort of reduce the call volume on the call center. So definitely something to consider. But this was probably the first main issue that we ran into when setting up our virtual operations. 
The, the second um, problem that we ran into was how to continue those um, normal briefings and meetings that we would find ourselves in with, within the EOC. And here we decided that we were going to use a, a, a video conferencing platform, something that was not um, widely used in the city prior to COVID, um, which it's just crazy how how so reliant we are on it now. And uh, we were never doing virtual video conferencing or anything like that. We've on occasion, we might be using freeconferencecall.com and um, you know, running a, a call that way, but nothing like this. So this is this was a big change for us. And we decided to use Zoom uh, just because it was really reliable and uh, the video and audio, audio quality was really good. Uh, people seem to have a lot of luck getting on and not having tech issues. Um, what we ended up doing was over time, we recognized that we needed about three licenses to be able to manage the number of simultaneously running meetings and briefings that were taking place within our, our city. And um, one of the reasons that, you know, we didn't go with Google Meet, which was part of the overall uh, platform that we were using at the time for our virtual EOC was because back in March of 2020, the the features between Google Meet and Zoom are, were very different. Um, they, they really, they, you couldn't even compare it. So uh, one of the things I think is interesting about these, these tools, all these tools that we're gonna talk about is um, how much some of them have changed just in the past year because they, they've recognized they need to catch up in order to uh, provide the necessary service for their customers. So some of the things that saved us on, on our video conferencing platform. So uh, again, we, we use those problem-oriented task forces that I showed you in that org structure to set up uh, all the different meetings that uh, took place. Um, and for each one of them, we had scripts uh, for what needed to take place, what types of um, things needed to be reported out on, who needed to be part of the meeting, all that stuff was uh, over time built out in an iterative format so that we um, didn't have to build it all from scratch to start. Uh, the other big piece of this was um, a really strong and disciplined operational cadence. So uh, we had a very specific schedule for all the different meetings and when they were going to take place. Uh, as an example, we had uh, every morning at 8 a.m. we had our public health call, which was with all the, the healthcare partners. Um, at 10 a.m., we had our citywide uh, unified command call, and that's where we went through each of the problem-oriented task forces and reported out on issues. And then uh, throughout the day, there would be other uh, calls that would take place for some of those task forces. You know, maybe every Tuesday and Thursday, we would have the supply unit call. Every uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would have the uh, community distribution task force. It was really dependent on the amount of activity and the amount of, of, of work that was being done. And what we decided was uh, we would ensure that we were only having these virtual briefings and meetings when there was content for those meetings and briefings. We weren't just going to hold them for no reason. So we made sure that we weren't reporting out on things that could be found elsewhere. Uh, as an example, a situation report, we're not going to reread it for you. Uh, over the call. So only things that were that were new or important critical information were, were reported out on these things. Um, and then we stopped the meetings. We, we either decided uh, that we, were, we would move it to one day a week or we would uh, move it to every other week or whatever the case might be to, um, to reduce the amount of fatigue uh, or Zoom fatigue as we've now coined it. Uh, we, we tried to slow that down as much as possible. Uh, some of the other more tactical things that we, we learned um, that saved us is making sure that we sent out calendar invites to all the key stakeholders so there was an easy thing for them to see the notification on their phone. They can click the link and automatically get into the, to the meeting rather than having to search around for things. And then also setting up and configuring each of the meetings to enable people to, to enter without the host. And this was important because there would be circumstances where the host that was supposed to be setting up that meeting couldn't jump on. And we didn't want a situation where people couldn't get on and, and, and be able to access that meeting. So that helped us as well. Uh, some of the lessons uh, as we progressed along with COVID, we started finding out about things like Zoom bombing. We, had, we didn't end up actually having any situations like that, but um, there were some pretty rapid changes to the security features and functionality of Zoom that we had to keep up with 
and try and understand how it would impact all of our pre-configured meetings and, and everything like that. Also knowing how many licenses we would need in order to concurrently run meetings. And, and that was something we, we learned over time where we, you know, we, we would add new licenses as we had more meetings. And as we started cutting back on meetings, we would shut licenses down. Uh, bandwidth, we found that there were some stakeholders that were working remotely and then just had poor internet connectivity. And we found that, you know, just telling them to dial in, uh, use their phone as their audio connection for Zoom uh, really helped to at least keep them uh, able to, to, to receive and, and send information over the audio, even if their video wasn't working. And, and then I think the other thing is we talked earlier about media richness or, or presence within a, a physical emergency operations center. One way that we try to combat that was asking people to keep their video on when possible. Uh, it wasn't all the time that people could do that, but when possible, it did help to uh, you know, allow for us to see those cues, those nonverbal cues on folks so that we could uh, more effectively manage the incident. So this is an example of that operational cadence I talked about. Uh, this is an ICS form that we had on Google Docs and we could keep it up to date uh, in real time. It was right up on the main section of our portal, which I'll show you. And uh, you can see, I mean, there's substantial number of, of, uh, of calls that were taking place throughout the, uh, the incident. And this was one, a one-stop shop for people to see what was going on and what calls that they needed to participate in. This is those scripts that I had mentioned. Uh, so there was one for each uh, meeting that we would have. And this enabled us to see what the call information was, uh, who needed to be part of the roll call, who needed to participate. And then who needed to do report outs uh, throughout uh, the entire process. And so um, these were very helpful. And for each of those meetings, somebody was um, documenting you know, key points for minutes. Uh, they weren't documenting every little thing, but they were at least keeping notes for some of the key things that needed to be documented. And then, as I mentioned, there's more of these. You know, each group had their own uh, scripts. So that way it was it was it was organized. People didn't want to find themselves in a meeting that was not really well run. And, and that was something that we, we really strive to prevent very early on. Again, these are all Google Docs, so they were easily edited and, um, you know, they, they, they could use each of these as a template, just change the dates. Uh, it, it was really, really good. And, and the fact that it wasn't a document that was being emailed back and forth, prevented a situation where there was an old version that was sent. They just went to the same link. Uh, and what they would do is they would do a page break and add the new set of minutes. So by the end of the incident, there were these documents that were, I don't know, 50, 50 60 pages long with these repeated notes. Uh, but what it ensured was that the links for these documents that were in the calendar invites were always the same. They could always go there and see the most up-to-date um, uh, script for that meeting, as well as the, the topics that would that would be run through. So the group chat was another component of this um, of this virtual EOC platform, and again, similar to our situation with um, Google Meet um, and and Zoom, we also had access to Google Chat as part of our our uh, Google Workspace uh, subscription. Uh, but the functionality was really poor. Uh, it's really only started to improve in the last uh, month or so with some new functionality. So um, Slack was really the, the kind of the, the most intuitive and um, most feature rich uh, platform that we were able to, to use. And we actually ended up using uh, the free platform. Uh, we didn't end up paying for the subscription. Um, we didn't need the functionality that it provided. Um, there were some things looking back that uh, the paid accounts probably would have been helpful for, um, but it really was not significant enough for us to go out and, and, and pay for uh, a per user account uh, for something like this. Um, what we decided was that the virtual EOC Slack, uh, the primary one would be set up and it would just allow for uh, government and key healthcare partners as part of our healthcare coalition. But we weren't going to allow for other outside uh, businesses or nonprofits to, to be on this platform. Um, and the same thing as, as the videos, 
the video uh, conferences, we set up uh, specific channels for each of those problem-oriented task forces, as well as the various units in logistics and planning. Uh, and we only built them out as we needed them. We didn't spend a whole bunch of time in advance um, you know, setting up all these different channels, which could potentially not be used at all. Uh, what we did is we just added them over time as we needed them and as people needed some, some location to coordinate their efforts. And Slack was also very handy for uh, you know, ad hoc uh, groups that would get set up. You know, if there was four people that needed to be on some sort of a, a communication, uh, it was an easy way for them to you know, chat back and forth and not have to cycle through thousands of emails in their email inbox. Uh, and then also direct chats. Uh, we did have a, a location that was set up um, on our portal, our virtual USC portal with people's cell phone numbers uh, so they could text them or things like that. But we found in so many cases, people were, it was so much easier just to go into Slack and type the person's name and you could easily send them a direct message back and forth. It was very, very convenient. Uh, another neat thing that I don't think a lot of people were using was uh, Slack enables a, a way for you to basically chat with yourself. The, the point of it is so you can type notes down or things like that. Uh, but it's a good way for you to do your ICS 214. And the reason for it is, is it timestamps every one of your posts. So you can just sit there and type in you know, important information uh, that you would normally put on your ICS 214. And uh, it sets it all up and, and archives it and, and everything like that. A uh, couple of weeks into the incident, we decided to set up a, se a separate Slack, another free account that was uh, oriented towards our businesses and nonprofits. And uh, what this was set up for was some sort of a communications channel for our community distribution task force to work with local businesses and nonprofits that were distributing supplies, food, and other services in the community. Uh, what we ended up finding out was, um, this was very successful to help uh, the, the, the community, the overall community organize their efforts. And uh, they did the same thing. They were able to set up uh, channels for some of the functional groups that they were organizing. And they're still using that Slack to, to, to uh, today. And they're using it for um, planning and uh, they'll use it for future incidents as well, which is kind of a neat, uh, a neat thing. So this um, is a, a really great success story. Some of the things that saved us on our uh, group chat, uh, having that mobile app, Slack has a mobile app that's very intuitive and easy to, to, to use. So everybody was, for the most part, uh, um, uh, they were kind of installing it on their mobile devices and using it pretty regularly. Uh, we did end up uh, doing some very basic training on how to use some of the, the key Slack functionality. Uh, we did that very early on. And uh, some of the big things was, uh, chat threads to prevent people from just simply putting in their response inside of uh, the channel. Uh, by having the chat threads, it was able to organize discussions much, much more effectively. Um, and then, uh, you know, teaching them very simple things that they probably never used before in any of their other communications tools, like putting the at symbol in order to mention somebody in a message, um, you know, things like that, that are they don't come intuitively to somebody unless they've used a tool like this before. But now everybody's using it and they're very familiar with it. Chat discipline was important. Uh, there was a couple of points where because the city had shifted over to virtual operations completely, some of the city departments uh, you know, were involved in uh, different projects that were not related to COVID. And they thought that the virtual EOC was a location for them to you know, put up information about different activities and initiatives they're working on. And uh, I, I needed to tell them, look, we can't use the system for this or else it's going to lose legitimacy as, as our, our EOC platform. So uh, they ended up setting up another Slack account uh, that was used for just sort of interdepartmental coordination uh, within the city. And then um, labeling the purpose of channels within Slack, simply going to the top, there's a way that you can say, this channel is to be used for this. And then also on our, our uh, virtual EOC portal, we had a sort of a help document as to what each channel was intended for. So that way people could easily understand what we were supposed to use each of the channels for. Um, lessons, I think one of the big concerns that we, we found was archiving messages. Um, the free version has a lot of challenges when it comes to archiving. You can archive and see all the 
um, public, I shouldn't say public, but all the, um, the channels that are not private, you can pull those archives all the way back to the beginning of creating the channel. The problem is, is there were many channels that we had created that were secure channels that we didn't have uh, every person in the Slack involved in, things like our public health channel or public safety channel. And so it's, it, it's very difficult for us to, to pull those uh, archive messages unless we wanna pay for the, the full version. And that's by user, so that's something that's a concern. Um, coordinating across multiple Slack instances, as I mentioned, we, we had you know, two different ones that we were using for our emergency operations, one that was for the general community and one for the, the, the government and healthcare coalition. And uh, there were a number of times where it was tough for our government partners who were on both systems to understand which of them they should be posting on related to a certain topic or action. Uh, and I, from what I understand, Slack does have some new functionality to, to make that a little easier, uh, but I, I've not played with that yet. And then uh, managing attached files in multiple locations. So one of the things we would find is that uh, people were uh, in the chats, each of those channels, they were you know, adding situation reports or um, attachments or different things that they wanted to share with whoever was in those groups. The, the problem was, is it was tough for us to go and find those, uh, especially because people don't consider or, or they're not thinking to look into the, into the search functionality to find those files. Um, so one of the things we did is we had uh, one of our interns who was simply all day just going through and taking attachment files and moving them into the appropriate folders that we had set up in Google Drive so that people could find those into the future. Uh, so that was definitely something. And that's something I think we, we would like to see some automation with in the future. So this is what our uh, virtual EOC uh, Slack looked like. And you can see on the left-hand side, we've got all those uh, functional channels and you know, the ones with the little lock symbol, that means that it was a secure channel. And um, you know, those were only accessible to people that we had added specifically to the channel. And then the other ones, people could add themselves um, and um, add others to it. But again, this was this, the, all of these only had people that were either city employees or they were part of the uh, key healthcare coalition partners. Um, but this, this, this worked pretty unbelievably. I mean, this, this was, it was so surprising to see the adoption, especially from people who never would use a system like this. This just helped us to organize everything and really uh, made this whole process a, a lot easier. And I, as I had mentioned, we had the uh, mobile app uh, that was very helpful as well. And this was sort of an example of, as I had mentioned, um, we would have these discussions that would pop up and it was easy for us to just uh, note who needed to, to be associated with this specific issue. And then there would be a thread that would be established. So that way it wouldn't continue to notify every person in that channel every time we send a new message. Uh, so it was a good way for us to, to kind of keep that fatigue of Slack from impacting people as well. So uh, the next component of our virtual EOC was uh, the Google site, which sort of brought everything together. Uh, so this was um, a, an internal Google site. It, you had to log in, you had to be added in order to, to access it. Uh, what we actually had is our city had, um, or our office specifically had a legacy um, Google Workspace account um, back when it was called uh, G Suite. And uh, it was a free version that had 10 accounts. Um, and it still, it still works. Um, you can still use it for those 10 accounts. Um, and it was back when Google was, was providing those uh, G Suite accounts uh, for free. So uh, what we ended up doing was we used this as sort of the foundation of our virtual EOC platform. Um, we created a couple of generic users using those 10 accounts. As an example, we created one for um, the main EOC staff, we created one for the Joint Information Center. Um, uh, there, there were probably like two or three others that we had added in. Uh, and then plus, you know, I have one specifically for me. Our other staff members have uh, some specifically for them. So that ended up taking up all 10 accounts. And those were the administrators for the system. And uh, what we did is we created a, a Google site that had uh, that we used the domain name that we had for um, for this uh, this this account, which was readynashua.org. 
And uh, what we allowed uh, people to do was um, uh, register with us using a Google account and uh, we would add them to the, uh, to the service so they could access this account. What we were concerned about was how would we, how would we keep track of who, was, who were registering, um, what, what email addresses would they be using, would they be using their personal Gmail addresses, um, it, it, we, there was a lot of confusion as to how we were going to go about doing this. So we basically set up some rules to say, all right, how are we going to, to roll this out? And what we decided was we would set up a Google group that would um, be the location where all credentials would be provided. Basically, in order to get access to this, you were going to be part of this group. And that way, we wouldn't have to worry about making sure that people were added to the Google Drive folders or added to the Google site or, or whatever the case might be, they only needed to be added once to the, to the, uh, to the Google group. And with all the, the Google products, when you're sharing either a file or a folder or a website like this, you can actually share it with the members of a, a Google group. So it allowed for us to pretty effectively manage in one location, the people who were gonna have access to this, to this tool. Um, one of the things we ended up doing was we, we built out some basic functionality, that minimum viable product for this tool. And over time, as we had new features or new things that we would roll out, we would just add them to this, to this platform. It was very easy in the middle of the incident to create a new page for something or to embed something new in the page. It was all drag and drop. It didn't require any coding or anything like that. And it was mobile friendly too, which was a pretty important piece of this. Uh, anybody could easily go onto their mobile device and see all the same things that somebody was seeing on their, uh, on their laptop. So that was a, another real big benefit. Um, the, the big things that saved is, as I mentioned, that Google group for, for access control was, was very important. Um, we also created some instructions for uh, people who uh, were going to get access to this, uh, but did not have a Google account associated with their, um, their work address, their, their Nashua email address. And we wanted people to register using their uh, Nashua email address. And basically what would happen would be is if they uh, no longer had access to their Nashua email address, they wouldn't be able to um, you know, request a new password or do anything like that. So we could easily shut them down off of, uh, off of this account as well. Uh, we found that that was more difficult than we had anticipated because people were logged into their personal addresses as well as their uh, work addresses. And they had to make sure that they were uh, selected under the right profile in order to access the, the portal or access the files. Uh, so that was, that was a challenge. And it's, uh, it's challenging on Google, but it's even more challenging on Microsoft. Uh, but it's the same problem, the underlying problem of, of, of personal versus work accounts in any of these platforms. Um, but the instructions that we provided, I think were, were very helpful for that. Uh, the other thing that was a neat way that we um, tried to integrate the, the Slack with this portal was uh, Google Sites allows for you to create menu items to external links. So what we did is we created a menu item for each of the Slack channels. So that way they could easily go into the Slack menu and right from this portal, see all the different channels that they could collect, click on. So we called it fake integration. There was no real integration there, but what it did is it made it a lot easier for people to kind of go back and forth between the two platforms. And then um, what we did is we, all the files uh, that we were that we were using for this incident were all set up in very organized Google Drive folders uh, rather than just adding them directly to the website. Uh, and the, the, the benefit of that was it was much easier to navigate the folder structure and you could easily embed those folders within the website. Um, you could you know, use your Google Drive to search, which you really couldn't do for the, the Google site. Um, uh, the, the, some of the problems, as I mentioned, personal work accounts, but one of the other problems was because all of these accounts that we were creating while they were using their Nashua uh, email addresses, they were still technically personal accounts. They, they weren't, you know, under some sort of central administration like you would find with other Google workspace uh, setups. The benefit there is we weren't, you know, we, we, didn't, we weren't paying a subscription cost for, you know, thousands of people. But what we now had a problem with is 
anybody could essentially share any of the documents with somebody else. It was, it was one of those things where we had to keep a close eye and make sure that people knew that they, you know, the permissions that we were giving them to the portal were just for them. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that's a consideration for organizations that are not using uh, Google Workspace as their enterprise communications platform. So this is what the, uh, the main page of the portal looked like. Uh, we've got at the top, we've got uh, all the menu items. Uh, this um, bar at the top, the green bar, uh, we can change the color of that to red to say that it's activated. Um, that was something that was a feature that they added in the middle of the pandemic, which was pretty cool, um, just to kind of give a very visual, like we have the EOC activated or we don't have it activated. It's tough when you're not in a, a physical EOC environment to know whether, you know, whether we're following the EOC processes for requesting items and, and information, or we're just using our normal processes. And uh, then these four main categories here were some key things that we had, uh, had like resource requests, questions, um, information for our joint information center, and then the overall situation report for the, for the incident. And then uh, here we had uh, the, that operational cadence document, which was embedded right into the site. So uh, it was always up to date uh, as, as we needed it. As you scroll down, we had uh, some information about Slack so that people could um, get information as to how to, to, to get on there both for the government one, as well as the community Slack. And then um, the Zoom video conferencing, one of the things that we had done uh, that was more critical in the early stages of the incident, when not very many people had video conferencing capabilities, uh, was to have a, a way for them to request a meeting to be set up so that they could uh, have some sort of coordination with one of their stakeholders. And so we you know, provided them with a process, email this central email address, uh, emergency at readynashua.org, and we would, we would set up and configure uh, a meeting for them. By the end of the incident, everybody had their own Zoom accounts anyway, so it really didn't matter. And this is a, at the bottom an example of the embedded folder system. So anybody could go in and select uh, the folders that they were looking for for files. Uh, if we you know, go through some of the other pages, you can see this is the public information page, and it has information that, that the main publicly accessible PIO-related pages uh, for, uh, for the state, uh, as well as the federal government. Um, frequently asked questions. That, that was actually a neat thing that uh, our Joint Information Center was doing was they were maintaining a centralized uh, frequently asked questions that was number one posted on our city website. So this, as new questions were added and new answers were added, it was automatically being updated. Uh, and number two, um, all of the people who were answering the phone in the city could easily look to the centralized and real-time Google Doc to see the appropriate answers to the frequently asked questions that were being brought in. So that way we didn't have somebody from the mayor's office answering it one way versus somebody from another office answering it another way. We didn't have to worry about version control. It was all one location. And as you scroll down, uh, then again, same concept. All the folders were embedded at the bottom so that people could find uh, whatever they were looking for. The org chart and contacts page. So at the top, we had the real time um, org chart that was set up for the incident as we would change. This was embedded, so it would update automatically. And at the bottom, which is a blank down because I don't want all the phone numbers and everything, but there was a uh, embedded uh, spreadsheet with uh, the ICS 205A uh, form, which has all of the phone numbers, people that were involved in the incident and all, all of that. One of the things that was uh, also neat about this platform was the ability for us to embed uh, external sources. And this was where we found a lot of our integrations between our ArcGIS platform and uh, virtual EOC. So this was a dashboard that was set up actually in partnership with NAPSIG. And it was our business and service status reporter. One of the things we did with our Office of Economic Development was coordinate with the Chamber of Commerce and Great American Downtown and many of the other partners to get real-time up-to-date information from our businesses uh, and also some of the nonprofits as to the status of their services. And so here, you know, we would be able to go on to virtual EOC and they could go to this page without having to find this specific dashboard in our ArcGIS folder structure. Uh, so that was a, another neat integration. 
And you can do the same thing we did it here with, uh, this is actually not the dashboard itself, but the website where the uh, Johns Hopkins dashboard was. So you could actually embed a whole nother um, website uh, here into this uh, Google site, which was very helpful as well. So web forms uh, was a component of this platform as well. And, and, and these were used when we wanted some sort of a formalized uh, documentation process or workflow for some sort of piece of information that was being requested. Um, as an example, we had in Slack a, a questions channel, which was very informal. People could ask questions and then somebody would respond back in a thread and say, you know, this is the answer to your question. Uh, but this was much more formalized. We wanted to have timestamps. We wanted to make sure that uh, it was acted upon. All those types of things really made it important to have a, a web form. So we use Google Forms. Um, and uh, the primary use for this we found was, was really our resource request platform. And um, what we did is, is there was a tab on the virtual EOC portal where you would click and it would go to this, uh, this Google Form. And it had all the pieces of information that we needed. And what we did is we tried to replicate the resource request form structure that was found on the state's uh, web EOC platform. And what this enabled us to do is as city departments uh, or even some of our local stakeholders that were requesting resources through the local EOC, as long as they were requesting it and filling out all the components of the form, if we didn't have that resource, then we would be basically be able to take that information and submit the same request on the state web EOC. Um, now that's not optimal because we're manually hand jamming it into that other system, but uh, it did save us the time of not having to try and interpret pieces of information and, and try and translate it over to another system. Um, the survey one, two, three from Esri, that was also used where uh, location data was a, a priority. I'll show you an example of that as well. But basically if, if what we wanted to do was take data and put it on a map, we would use Survey123 instead, uh, instead of Google Forms. Um, so I talked about you know, things that saved us with those common fields and as well as status, having the same status fields uh, that, were, that were used in WebEOC at the state level. So that way we, we could use the same thing locally to say whether the, um, the resource request was assigned or whether we can't fulfill it. We used the same terminology and everything. So it was, it was very good. Um, Google Forms, some of the challenges we ran into. Um, Google Forms basically populates all that those records into a backend Google Sheet. And that's nice because it keeps it up in real time and adds those individual records to each row of that, that sheet. But what we found was people wanted um, to go directly into the sheet and add new records. And what that did was it would break the whole process. It would, it would really mess it up. So what we had to tell them was, if, even if you have access uh, as, as a member of the supply unit to that specific spreadsheet, you need to go into the form and fill it out in the form instead. Um, using structured data, I think all of you, if, if any of you have ever been in any sort of database or anything like that, that's so important to be able to sort and, and search for things. So definitely structured data when, when possible. Um, survey one, two, three, as we found, um, was very nice to be able to create some cool maps with. Uh, but when it came to, to using the back end data, uh, we basically had to ex export a file. And again, now we're, we've got something that's, that's a static file that's only as up to date as that moment in time. So that, that was definitely a problem. It would be nice if there was some way to take that, uh, that survey one, two, three data and have it into a real time Google Sheet, just like uh, we would use Google Forms for. And then I, I also mentioned that manual transfer of resource requests from the city to the state uh, was, was sort of a mess and, and really add a lot of unnecessary extra work. So this was uh, screenshots of, of that resource request section. As I mentioned, it's a tab on the portal. Uh, you would fill out the form. And uh, basically, you went through the process, added uh, each piece of information. This just shows you some examples. And what would happen is uh, it would populate that spreadsheet on the back end. And what we did for transparency is on that same tab on virtual EOC, we had an embedded version of that spreadsheet. So you could see as you entered in a request, you could see that pop up here on, um, on this spreadsheet as well as us in the back end changing the status of the resource request or adding notes in about 
whether we're going to send it to the state or whether we think we can find it in-house or whether we put in an order for it. Um, so this was sort of your status page right here. And uh, again, it required very little amount of information for us to keep that up to date without having to send new documents out or, or anything like that. It was, it was, it was very intuitive, honestly. Um, and then just, this just kind of scrolls over and you can see these, this was a status field here where it says complete or close. And those, uh, each of those fields were color coded. And again, they aligned with the colors that were being used in the state's web VOC. Um, so it was, it was really, really nice. Another thing that we, um, another example of this uh, form data, uh, we also had one which was called our information request tracker. And what we would do is uh, if there was some sort of a, a, a question that was uh, beyond our ability at the local level to answer. So one of our city departments might ask a question, um, like here as an example, our welfare department asked about uh, the state's Bureau of, um, of, of Welfare Services were they conducting uh, outreach with their clients? I don't have the answer to that. So what we needed to do is we needed to submit an information request up to the state. And so this uh, internal form we were using uh, allowed people who didn't have access to the state's web EOC system, which not everybody does, um, we would be able to take the information from that platform and again, manually hand jam it into this so that way at least our clients and customers would be able to see what the status of that information request was. So this was another tab on the, um, on the platform. This is an example of, of survey one, two, three. We're using this uh, as a way to collect information from businesses within the community on essential services and uh, what uh, the status of their business was and um, you know, whether they were uh, deemed essential by the state. And so that way our, our Office of Economic Development could coordinate uh, with them directly. And uh, this, this allowed us to do a lot of, of uh, graphs and uh, maps and things like that on the back end. But the challenge was it wasn't a real time uh, database for us to maintain. The collaborative documents piece was uh, a really essential component of, of WebEOC or our virtual emergency operations center. And, and what, um, what this allowed us to do was really work on all of our incident action planning um, in a, an approach that we were sitting there all working together in the same room. And um, the city had been using uh, basically a shared file server and um, in order to get onto that shared file server, you had to get onto the VPN. Um, it, it really was not going to work for, for this incident. And um, especially with the number of, of uh, VPN uh, Citrix um, uh, licenses that we had available, it just wasn't going to work. So we had to use some sort of cloud-based solution. And that's you know, why we decided to use um, uh, Google Drive for this function. And so we had been in our office, had been using Google Drive uh, just internally for nearly a decade. And it allowed us pretty quickly to be able to transfer from in-person to uh, working remote. All of our staff have been working remote since, uh, since March of last year. And, uh, and it's because we were very familiar with how to use these systems in, in, a, in a business environment. Uh, and it's, it was a game changer for us. And so really the work was trying to get all these other departments who were now gonna be engaged in this response up to the same level as us when it came to using these tools. Um, the situation report, which you'll see, I'll go through some screenshots, uh, was a Google doc that was organized into uh, sort of a table format. And what was nice was everybody could update it. So each of those individual problem-oriented task forces could go in and add their information. Uh, the units could add their information. Uh, it all didn't have to go through the situation unit in order to update that document. And the other piece was that I had full revision history over the whole thing. So I could see who was adding information to it. I could see what information was added to it. Um, so there was no concern that people would be adding information in incorrectly because we could see what was being done throughout the entire process. Something you can't really do when it comes to those static office documents that we normally use. Um, the uh, ICS forms, we, we use that for our incident action plan. We had Google Docs versions of all those forms that were put into the folder structure. 
Um, and then the other big thing is, is all of our um, SOPs for how to operate within each one of those problem-oriented task forces, everything from how to conduct a resource request, how to submit a press release, um, all the things that we do in the EOC, we're all in Google Docs SOPs, and they could be easily added to, updated, commented on on the fly. People can make suggestions for revisions on the fly. Um, it, was a, it was a completely different way to do planning. Because in the middle of the incident, rather than you know, somebody on a post-it note saying, we need to update that plan after this is all done and over with, we were doing it in real time. And as the change was made, everybody could see it in real time. Uh, it helped because in the virtual environment, we're not all sitting there in the room together. We can't you know, walk over to somebody and say, hey, what do I do in this case? Um, but what we had was real-time updated SOPs that everybody could fall back on and, and not have to ask as many questions. Uh, Google Sheets was used pretty significantly with our supply unit um, for, uh, we had a, a kind of a, a workbook that was set up for um, our, our inventory for supplies, uh, as well as the distribution of supplies. Um, and that was a pretty complex workbook that we were able to set up. Um, they also were using it for um, burn rate. Uh, so we had one uh, that was set up specifically to track the status of, of supplies, per, particularly personal protective equipment and, and cleaning supplies across all the city departments. And we could see those being you know, burned down uh, over time and, and had graphs and everything like that. And it was all being done in the cloud. It was, it was really nice. Um, and then, as I had mentioned earlier with the portal discussion, uh, all of these documents that we were talking about here could be embedded in the portal. So that way they could be kind of organized so you didn't have to go through any folder structures if you didn't want to. The um, collaborative documents, uh, using them day to day within our office made the shift from our personnel to the virtual environment uh, seamless. There was, there was really no impact at all. Um, version history, uh, version control, that was something that was uh, made drastically simpler by using these tools. And uh, one of the things that we also did with the situation report was every day we downloaded a, a copy of, we exported a copy of the situation report. So we had a daily kind of archive that was easy for people to access. We, we could easily go into the version history and see uh, all the changes that were made all the way back to the beginning of the file. But sometimes people just wanted an easy to access document to go to uh, so they could see what was happening on a specific day. So we did that every day. We, at the end of the day, we would export that situa situation report and, and it would be in an archive folder. Some of the lessons, um, one of the things we found was, you know, people adding new information. Uh, it was challenging to kind of figure out what was new and what wasn't unless you went into the version history. So we asked people to use sort of the common tactic that's, that's used to make new data um, in a different color. So we made them put it in blue or, or whatever. Um, the other thing that we found, especially for the supply unit work, the resource inventory, all that uh, was, it was a little challenging uh, to, to run some of that stuff in Google Sheets because it's not a database tool. Um, so I think in order to really do some advanced inventory management, you need to, to look at something like uh, Airtable or Google has a new platform out called Google Tables, uh, which is you know, part of this, this Google workspace process. And um, you know, the idea there is it's much more uh, much more flexible to, to manage an actual database, which is what we're thinking about when it comes to inventory management. Uh, and I think the final piece of lessons learned for, for collaborative documents is really, it, it is unbelievable how many people um, don't understand how these cloud-based office solutions work. Um, you know, so many questions early on about where, where's the save button? And um, it, it's something that was a pretty drastic shift for, for so many people. This is what our situation report looked like. As I mentioned, it's you know a table format on Google Docs, and uh, we only added information that we thought was helpful or useful to, to put in here. So you know the top really was our incident priorities. And then we had all of our task force updates. So uh, each of those, I think we had at total maybe uh, nine task forces that were problem oriented task forces. They were going to put in information about their current actions. What are they doing in the next one to two weeks? any needs or gaps that they have. And then uh, we also add, added uh, essential elements of information. 
And those were the, the statistics that were showing us changes in their response. Uh, and, and it was kind of helping us to, to gauge whether things were getting better or getting worse. And you know, just again, some more examples of, of at the, within the situation report at the task force level, you can see some of the data that we were collecting, the actions that they were taking, um, all of that was, was broken down pretty nicely and it was updated on a daily basis. Then we had information from the supply unit telling us about uh, what supplies were available, uh, funding that was available, the cost unit was keeping track of information as to what uh, we were getting for reimbursements. Uh, the Joint Information Center was keeping up the data information as to what was going on. Uh, the GIS unit, the future planning unit, we actually had our, our library uh, reference librarian serving as the future planning unit, which was an innovative approach uh, because they they do this. They, they do research to figure out, um, you know, they have familiarity with the different uh, databases and uh, scholarly literature. So we use them as our future planning unit and they would keep their information uh, up here as well. Uh, and then we had a section on municipal continuity. So each of the divisions would provide updates uh, on what the status of their city services are and they would put that information on as well. This is an example of the, uh, the, the inventory and distribution workbook that I had mentioned. You can see at the bottom of this, there was a bunch of different tabs which allowed us to um, see the various inventories um, for uh, each of our, our um, uh, city departments as to what they currently had on hand and it allowed us to track the burn rate. For, for all of this. And so this was something actually our financial services department put together and they, they did a really nice job with this. And then this is our uh, database for the supply unit, which showed uh, really the overall uh, supplies that they had within the supply unit and where they were gonna be distributing any orders that they had taken in. So um, this was um, broken down. Each uh, column was a specific type of item. And then, um, you could see uh, in this sort of summary page uh, that there were certain amounts that were requested by departments, how many were ordered by the departments, um, the received within the supply unit, and then how many the, the supply unit had distributed to the various departments. This is how we were keeping track uh, overall, all the orders and, and purchases that we were making uh, as part of this response. And you can see again down at the bottom, there's a substantial kind of workflow that took place. This was good for a basic functionality, but I would say that um, it was a little challenging to kind of put it together for the first time. So I think something like Google tables or air tables is probably a better approach for somebody trying to do something complex like this. These are those SOPs that I had mentioned. So each of the um, units as well as the problem oriented task forces had SOPs on how to do all their different functions. And uh, you could hyperlink within the SOP uh, and in real time, you can make modifications, edit them, change them. Um, and this really helped uh, through this whole, whole process. So this on the left-hand side was a, a page from the supply unit SOP. This is a page from the Joint Information Center SOP. Here are those ICS forms I had mentioned from the Incident Action Plan, again, into Google Docs. And then this is a uh, example of the 205A form with the cell phone numbers from all the people who were involved in our, our incident response. Let's kind of close this out with uh, the overall lessons learned and what we think is really the future of virtual EOCs. So our, our key things that we learned through this process really are, gotta keep it simple. Uh, don't build something that's overly complicated, especially if it's gonna be used for the first time. And um, make sure that you are really building something that meets the minimum uh, essential functionality for that, uh, for that organization. And then over time, iterate and improve upon it as people request new features or request changes the way that the user interface works. Um, don't try and build it all at once because you'll never get it done. Uh, one of the big lessons learned for us is don't become IT support. Because this wasn't uh, a platform that was built by our IT department, they didn't know how to use any of it. Um, they didn't know how it worked. Um, and, and that was a problem because we had to dedicate uh, one of our interns to just doing kind of IT support related to uh, the virtual EOC. So definitely something to, to really consider because if you work with your IT division early on, 
they can provide the necessary support to the customers within your organization. Again, design the system now, not during the incident. Um, that's something that I think is, is really essential. And the only reason we were able to pull this off is because we really had built sort of a pilot years ago that we were able to adapt pretty quickly for this exact, this exact scenario. Um, making sure that you consider the licenses and uh, credentials for whatever your system is. And that's something that um, we were able to get by pretty inexpensively within the city. Um, again, using free Slack, using a, a legacy free grandfathered version of Google Workspace um, and, and three Zoom accounts that were at the lowest professional level. Uh, it was very inexpensive for us, but you can see as you add more functionality and more paid services that this could be, become very expensive, especially if you're using a service that is paid by the user. Uh, so it, it may actually require that you use whatever system your jurisdiction is using. If you're on Office 365 or if you're on Google Workspace, uh, this could be a pretty cost-effective solution if you're already using those types of tools. Um, but if you're not, it's, it's, it's possibly going to be expensive. And um, making sure that your stakeholders uh, know how to use all these systems by providing them with some essential training early on in that incident, uh, just-in-time training is, is definitely something that can be done. Um, making sure that you formally document all the procedures and functions that the system are used for, and that was something important for us as we developed all the SOPs for all of our task forces, making sure that they knew the workflows in each part of, of this system. Uh, we also found that our, our ERP system, our communications platform, like the Exchange Server, was really outdated, antiquated, could not provide the necessary level of support that we needed for a pandemic uh, to, to really run a virtual EOC. So that's the reason why we had to sort of build something outside of our, our city network in order to really get by. And I think it's also essential we learned uh, that you, you need to figure out how this is going to work with a, a physical EOC if you're doing both. Um, you know, what types of actions are going to take place in the physical EOC and then what types of of actions are going to take place virtually uh, is something that you really need to consider. And, and we had to, to really think through as we started dealing with some of the protests and, and other actions uh, later on in the pandemic. What are we doing in the future? So some of the things that we're working on now is uh, we're shifting uh, those non-Google systems uh, really away from the virtual EOC uh, because Google has made some pretty significant uh, upgrades to Google uh, Meet, their video conferencing, and Google Chat, which is their uh, chat functionality, at least to give us some parity between what, what systems we were using before. And that helps to reduce the number of, of logins and, and user information that we have to try and keep track of. Um, so that's definitely a big piece of, uh, of trying to simplify that. Um, the other thing, as I mentioned, uh, Google Sheets is not really a database tool. So for some of the database functions that we would need, um, we're looking at uh, tools like Airtable and, and, and Google's new table solution. And um, I think that'll provide us with some better functionality, at least on resource requests and, and resource management. Um, identifying additional opportunities to automate functions. So you'll see some videos in this, uh, this on-demand session uh, for, for folks who are using Microsoft uh, Office 365, things like Power Automate allow you to automate some of these functions. And Google doesn't have something really similar to that, but uh, there are sort of third-party solutions that can be used to do things like that on the Google Workspace side. And I think we'll, we'll look at that to see what can be automated to simplify some of those as well. Um, considering uh, using this platform from resource catalog and tracking, one of the things that we had played around with many years ago as well was uh, using some sort of an online cloud-based tool to track uh, municipal resources. Um, and that's something I think we'll also consider as we, as we explore some of those database tools. Um, setting up templates for future incidents uh, so that it reduces the rollout time. So uh, right now, the system has basically got a ton of data and content from the COVID-19 response. Um, that's pretty much slowed down to really just public health at this point. And so we need to sort of clean out the system, archive all the old files and set up a template so that we're ready to activate it for a future incident. And also reviewing how GIS integrates with this uh, virtual EOC. We've 
really just had some basic integration between survey one, two, three for some forms as well as some integrated dashboards. But beyond that, there's not really been a whole lot of integration there. So that's something else for us to consider as well. Uh, continuing to train our stakeholders, both within the city as well as some of our other uh, critical uh, nonprofit business stakeholders. And then, as I had mentioned on the lessons learned, we got to get IT more involved in this uh, because we really need them to be able to provide the necessary technical support um, and potentially even you know, try and transition some of their antiquated systems to these new uh, cloud-based tools so that it's um, used daily within the city versus just used during an incident. What do I think about the future of virtual emergency operations centers? Uh, to me, this will be something that, um, that plays a larger role uh, in certainly pandemic response, but non-pandemic response as well. I, just from many of the people I've talked to as part of this Inspire session, it seems like everybody has thought about how at some level they're gonna use this for um, for incidents that historically they would have used a physical EOC for. And um, the problem that I think we're going to run into is how we sort of coexist with physical EOCs and or what types of, of work is done within a physical EOC when you have this very um, distributed virtual platform that's being used by many stakeholders who wouldn't have typically been in your physical EOC. So uh, we don't want fragmented operations. We don't want um, you know, people making decisions in a room and not providing that information over the virtual platform. We, those are things to consider and figure out how we're going to adapt to that, uh, that new way of working. And um, I, I think it's also important to, to note that there's going to be vendors out there that are, are going to try and sell uh, products that they're calling virtual emergency operations products that are not going to work for you uh, in the same way that we've had vendors trying to sell emer emergency alerting platforms that don't work for people and, um, and many other solutions. Uh, the, the key is, is to understand what your features, feature requirements are. Uh, understand how your workflows are, are set up within your organization. And, and then you can start to look at the technology solutions that are available out there. And the key is, is to have technology solutions that are easily flexible and, and can pivot in the middle of an incident. So that way you're not locked into one specific way of doing business. So that's sort of my beware piece of this is, you know, don't, don't just automatically say, uh, you know, somebody's coming out with a, a post COVID uh, golden solution to your problems, um, really think it through before you go down this route. And uh, this will also change the nature of organizational structures. We're going to see a much more flattened incident response structure because now rather than having um, your various incident command posts out in the field and the associated staff and resources that are assigned to them, and then an EOC, and then more EOCs as you move further and further up in that uh, jurisdictional level, you're going to have a much more flattened organizational structure where people will be able to collaborate really as all as if they're part of the same organizational structure. So that's something else we'll have to consider, and it, it might even require changes to the way that we, we look at organizational uh, incident management uh, or, or NIMS doctrine. So that's definitely something for us to look at as well. The needs that we have moving forward are really around having some sort of a community of practice. And this is something that NAPSIG as well as uh, FEMA's National Integration Center is currently working on to build uh, a subgroup uh, where we can actually develop the future guidance and smart practices around virtual emergency operations center. And so that's something if you're interested uh, to, to reach out to uh, NAPSIG and, and find out how to get involved with that. Um, having you know, it integrated into the training. Uh, there are EOC courses that FEMA maintains right now, the, the 2200 course, which is an independent study course, as well as the 2300 course, the intermediate EOC operations. Um, those you know, need to include uh, virtual operations and the considerations to make in, in those types of activities. Um, grant funding. So there's always been this concern about um, having some funding to be able to build out your physical EOC. And 
programs typically will use things like the emergency management performance grant, or even if we think back to many years ago when there used to be separate grants for EOC uh, build out, um, that has not really been the same for you know, software solutions or uh, services that you have to pay for uh, over a, a long period of time that would go beyond the performance period of the grant. So I think that also needs to change in, in how we look at uh, our Homeland Security grants, emergency management grants, and how we can use them to, to, to fund virtual, uh, virtual platforms. And we also have some key considerations that I think need to be done moving forward that maybe we didn't think through completely as we moved into the COVID response, but now that we'll catch a breath and, and actually have the time to, to really think through some of these things, uh, we really need to do it. And that's uh, security on these systems, making sure that we have the ability uh, to maintain these systems during any sort of a, uh, an operating environment, whether it be a, a communications failure or um, you know, even a, a failure of one of these cloud-based solutions. Um, and then also interoperability. Uh, we, you know, so long ago, we're talking about radio interoperability. Well, we also need to consider the interoperability between things like Microsoft Teams and Zoom and Google Meet and, and how we're going to ensure people have access to be able to get onto these platforms. Um, you know, I think for, for right now, it's, uh, I guess, as easy as downloading 20 different uh, video conferencing apps onto your phone. Uh, but are there ways to use standards and, and other approaches so that, uh, that we can have some interoperability between platforms? And then uh, integration with planning activities. So uh, I, I talked a little bit about how we really use these collaborative platforms for our SOPs, uh, but I can see a way to use this for hazard mitigation planning and emergency operations plans um, that will provide a much more um, uh, feature-rich selection of ways to, to, to kind of plan and, uh, and handle the, the immediate response. Uh, even looking at things like geo-enabled plans or crowdsourcing to have the overall community add edits and uh, pieces like that. It, it's, there's a lot of opportunity out there to also look at how we're using this for planning rather than just response and recovery. So um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our uh, virtual operations center rollout and what we think the future holds for, uh, for virtual EOCs. Certainly feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or uh, are looking for uh, any support on your virtual EOC implementation in your jurisdiction. Thank you.